One, two, three. One, two. Do you hear me well? All right. So I guess we are almost ready to start. It's about one minute before, before the schedule. So welcome, everyone. And this talk will be, will be, run, will be, will, will, will be run in English because, uh, you know, I'm speaking Russian, but we have some, some schedule, and this talk is scheduled in English language. So welcome, everyone. And I hope you enjoyed your breakfast and you are ready to, to listen to some, some hard, hardcore talk. Are you ready? Yeah. Great. So let's start. My name is Oleg. And before I'm going to, 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 to define what we are going to do, I'm, I want to share for whom this talk, because this is really important. I want to prepare you to this you know, to this presentation. First of all, if you want to learn something new or you want to learn about non-blocking I.O., this talk is for you. If you want to learn a little bit on, of reactor, of project reactors in action, then this talk for you. And if you want to understand how reactive approach maps in server side or especially at server side Neo, then this talk also for you. Finally, be ready to see lots of hardcore, hardcore kind of code, lots of um, project reactor code, and in general to, to some lots of information. So let's start. If you're still with me, my name is Oleg. I'm from Ukraine, from Kyiv. I work for Netify. We are doing lots of reactive stuff here. And I'm contributor to Project Reactor and core team of our socket project. Also, I'm helping this organizing of some of Ukrainian conference, and if you want to join some of them, please let me know. I will share some discounts with you. All right, a little bit of marketing. I wrote a book about pro reactive programming at Spring, so if you're curious, just let me know. I gave away one yesterday. If you want to buy, let me know. I will share a discount as well. And finally, agenda after all the marketing. Today, we are going to start with why do we need reactive server? Why do we need this approach and why it's better than, than other approaches? What do we need to, to have this reactive server? And finally, how to do this reactive server? All good? Are you ready to, to get this information? Great. So let's start. Let's start with discussion. What do we want to see here? First of all, we want to see a server. This is the basic, right? Nothing complex so far. Then every server accepts connections, right? So we want to see some connect, connection acceptance and some business logic and clear, transparent way to, to handle this, this connection and process it. This, that's basically what we want to have here. Of course, we want to have some pool of workers and we want to handle all the connections on the different workers, right? Because we want to share the load between all the cores and explore, kind of, and use everything on the Mac for, from, uh, to the maximum from our hardware. That we, that what we basically what we want to see here. Then we want to see some. We want to have some back pressure support because this is really important. Yesterday we have shown this. Uh, we we show this uh, with Sergey why back pressure is really important, and that's why we want to have some back pressure support and only consume data when and only when our connection is ready to consume this data. So we want to send some request, and as a response to this request, we want to send some bytes, protest them, and write back to the channel. Is it clear? So far, so good. Okay, let's go forward. So how it can look, how it could look like from the from the code perspective? What we want to have, we want to have some definition of clear server kind of creation. We want to define some host and port. That's easy. Then we want to we want to have a definition or way to define a handler for connections. So we, we want to accept connection, say, OK, we want to receive some data. And we want to receive the, those data in reactive way. For example, using pr Project Reactor, we want to define some mapping, filters, logs, and we want to have some clear way to send the, those data back or this, this stream back using the same Project Reactor and reactive streams. So this is how it could look like. Finally. We want to run the server. We want to call a start method. And of course, we want to block main method in order to, and main thread in order to keep application running. Is it clear what we want to have here? All right. Let's move forward 
and let's first of all ask the question, why do we want to see like, like the server like this? However, we have to take a look at this question from the different perspective and maybe ask ourselves why, what's wrong with blocking IO? Why, it, why it's not enough to just process everything in the blocking way, right? Good question. So let's take a look at the demo. In order to, to show why blocking IO is, isn't that well, isn't that good, I'm going to implement simple, simple blocking socket server. Have you ever seen and, and heard about server socket? Have you ever tried to write something like that? Any, anyone? OK, just a few hands. So this is the simplest way to create a socket server, to accept some sockets here, and of course, read some data, read some bytes from the incoming connection. And here we can process those data line by line and the okay, say, I got a line, then I want to say echo as a response. This is a really simple server. So let's just try to run it. It's running. And now I'm going to, do you see it well? Is it recognizable for you? Do I need to increase maybe the font size? All good? OK. So I'm going to create a connection using Tallnet. I just connect it to my local host, and now I can write hello world, and you can see echo hello world. Now I'm, I'm going to run some random words, and you will be able to observe some echo messages back. That's how it basically works. So what's wrong with that? The wrong side is once we try to open another connection, you won't be able to receive anything. Do you see it? I'm just writing some random words and it doesn't work. But at the same time, this guy is still working. And this doesn't work. OK, so what's wrong? Let's go back to, to the code and let's take a look. Does anyone see the problem here? The main problem here is what? Right. We only we, we process everything in one thread, but the I.O. is blocking. So once we started processing one, one input stream, we block the thread. And we can't handle anything else. So do, do you know any other solutions for that? What do you do when you have to handle blocking? Right. We can, we can, we can create a, an executor service, right? We can create a thread pool. So let's do that. So let's create a thread pool like that. Really convenient way to create a thread pool. I have 12 cores on my machine. Let's, let's stick to four threads on my machine, just for a demo case. So we, are cre we just created a thread pool with four threads. And now we are going to handle everything on a separate thread pool like that. So this is basically the same code. I'm using some, some wrappers around my lambdas in order to avoid kind of wrapping everything into try-catch because I don't like to, to show how you can wrap everything into try-catch. So I'm using here some external library in order to, to make my, my lambda thread kind of exception safe or something like that and avoid and check it and check it exception at all. So what I'm doing here basically is the same, reading lines and that's it. So let's try to rerun the server and see what, what will happen. It works. Let's go to, to see. Yeah, this guy is working. This guy is working as well. Let's try to open another connection. Still working. Looks pretty good, right? And another connection. But what about another one? Again, the same problem. Because we are out of available threads. So final, I guess, the final solution will be doing something like, OK, we have some limitation for threads. Let's just avoid any limitations. Let's just create unbounded pool of threads or cache thread pool. Have you ever heard about cache thread pool before? OK, great. So this is basically a pool once you are, which kind of gives you as much or as many threads as you want. So this is basically a solution we really want to have here. And now we're just going to restart our application. And now we will be able to basically open as many connections as we want. So let's just do the same as before. 
and five, the fourth. Yeah, it's still working. Great. So, of course, I can open as many tabs as I can, and this will be really boring. That's why I prepared some, some small, teeny dosser. I call it dosser. Yeah, here we go. I have a dosser application, which is basically open a connection, open a plain socket connection, and start sending some spam messages like this on the, on the thread pool, the same fixed thread pool. So I'm, I'm spamming my, my server in order to figure out whether it works, whether it can handle that many connections or it can't. This is basically 10,000 of, of kind of connections. So this is really well-known problem, taken problem. And now we are going to verify whether this plain blocking server can survive. So let's, let's just, yeah, it, it works. So let's just start my dosser and figure out whether it works or not. Looks like it works. So let's wait a little bit. And yeah, still working or not. It stopped. Do you see it? It stopped. So let's check whether it works. OK, it seems like it's working. Let me try to open another one. No, it doesn't. Shit, something went wrong. Oh. That's what happened here. Again, I love this exception. Pretty good. So what happened, basically? Let me just stop all these guys in order to avoid any crashes. Yeah, because, because you know, with blocking, everything can went wrong. So what happened here? Basically, threads is, really, is something really expensive. And every, every thread take, takes around about one megabyte of memory. So in case we want to handle 10,000 of threads, we have to kind of prepare 10 gigs of memory or more because we have some information and, and some bytes processing during the, the business kind of inside our business logic. So it can take even more than 10 gigs of memory, which is wasteful of which is absolutely un, kind of, uh, which doesn't make any sense. In turn, when we have too many connections, when we have too many threads, we have really high concurrency because every thread tries to access some data and we have really lots of context switching and so forth and so on, which is really bad as well. So let's go back to our presentation and let's do some summary and let's take a look at some drawbacks of blocking AI. First of all, the main draw drawback is inefficient resource usage because today we are running everything in the cloud and we want to we want to prepare and give to our container container only a few gigs of memory, right? That's why it doesn't work in the cloud and it won't work. It increases your latency because of context switching. Easy to DDoS, you saw that. I created lots of connection and my application crashed. And finally, okay, let's, there is, along with drawback, there is some benefits, which is plain implementation, strive forward implementation in a parity way, but it doesn't work in high performance, especially in game development, right? So that's why we want to have some non-blocking server, right? Have you ever tried non-blocking IO before? Okay, just a few hands, cool. So for those who don't know what is Neo, let me explain the basics about non-blocking I.O. for you. So the main central point in non-blocking I.O. is server socket channel. The second part is selector. This, this is the main, this, the main central components of non-blocking I.O. In order to start listening for new connections, you have to register your selector into server socket channel and define your intent to listen to new acceptance, to new connections, to new incoming connections. So once you get a socket channel, this is a representation of connection, of incoming TCP connection. Once you get a socket channel, you will be notified over selector that you got a new connection. All right, we got a new connection. We want to read some data, right? So in order to read some data, we have to register another listener, but that's time at socket channel, so we have to register our selector into socket channel in order to listen to operate, operation reads. So once we got some data, some bytes, we will be notified of our selector again, and we'll be able to start processing data, provide some business logic, do some business logic on top of this data, and prepare a response. 
that's what we basically what that's what are we basically doing in in real applications we prepared some response and this time we want to write some data back but now we are not at non-blocking world which means that anything can happen at for and it's not kind of uh, there is no guarantee that we will be able to write the whole data the whole package of bytes and now we have to handle another case we have to store our data somewhere we have to register another listener another socket kind of another selector we have to define that now we want to listen to operator and write so this is basically an intent to okay let me know when you, when the socket channel will be available for write and once we got this notification back we will be able to try it again until we we wrote the whole data set to, to the socket channel. Is it clear how it works? Okay, great. From the code perspective, it looks like something similar to what we saw. Basically, here we start the server, and here we have a definition that this server, this server socket channel must be non-blocking. This is important point. Then we create a selector, we open it and say, okay. Hey, Hey, buddy, server socket channel, please let me know once we got new connection. And once we got new connection, so we have to loop, 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 loop. And this selector select is basically blocking. So it will block your thread until you got a notification about any selection key. So this is this guy's selection key. Once we get a selection key, we will be able to do some business logic through if else cases. So what we can do here? So once we started all this machinery, all this complex mechanism, we can start, for example, accepting connections like that. So this is basically the logic related to, so to new socket channel acceptance. Here we accepted our socket channel. Of course, we have to create a map which associate your socket channel and some queue in which you will be able to store some byte buffers because because now everything is unrelated. There is no direct con connectivity be be between business logic and your new server. That's why you have to have some storage in which you can put some data. So you created everything, created a queue associated with your socket channel, and now you have to register for operation reads. OK, we are ready to read. So what happened next? We got some data back. We got another else. We got another selection key, so now we can get a socket socket channel we can allocate some byte buffer read to to this byte buffer some data and then try to apply some business logic process this byte buffer somehow this is another challenge to to send this byte buffer to some handler to some business logic this is another absolutely different problem which i don't know how to to solve normally correctly and really in a really simple way so we have to do that somehow and of course once we have done that we have to kind of enqueue processed buffer back to to the queue that's what happened next and after all after all we have to say okay now we are ready to listen to writes the next step is of course write the far the worst Afterward, we have to drain the queue. We have to, to try to write our byte buffer to, to outgoing channel. And once we've done that, we, of course, have to, to say our intent for reads again. And this is how it works. Read, writes, read, write, read, writes, lots of actions. So what's wrong with that? Where is the complexity here? Do you know? Basically, everything related to Neo1 API is complex. This is really complex machinery, like really complex mechanism. I agree with that. Do you agree with that? Yes. Then the second problem is that selector, which is basically a channel for events, is absolutely unrelated with data. So what I want to have from selector, what I want to see from selector is ability to get some byte buffers instead of doing lots of actions. And finally, reads and writes in non-blocking fashion is another challenge which is, of course, related to non-blocking non -blocking IO. But again, wait, we just talked about some multi-threading, multi some back pressure support, how we can handle back pressure in this way. I don't know. How we can run everything in multi-threading environment? Yeah, of course, it's doable, but this is really complex kind of question and challenge. So basically, once you start working with Neo, it, you will end up like this Gomer sitting around his reactor and this will be 
really headache. However, I have a friend of mine, I have kind of good seeds from, from Venkat, we, who says that you, have, you don't have to walk from complexity, right? That's fine. You have to run! But, of course, we have to run to reactive streams, because reactive streams is something better. It's about streaming, and streaming is always is, is better approach as, from, as for me. First of all, reactive streams is about asynchronous non-blocking streaming. And here you have a normal composition of your connection, which is basically a stream of bytes, and reactive stream, which is basically logical streams in Java or any other languages, right? So this is a good continuation of one into another. In turn, this is naturally fits to Neo because this is about events handling. And finally, it has built-in back pressure. Reactive streams is about back pressure. So let me quickly introduce and show what is reactive streams. So this is basically three main interfaces, like Publisher, which allows you to, to subscribe using subscriber. Subscriber looks like that. So subscriber basically has only four methods, the main of which is on next, on error, on complete. And the final is subscription, which is basically allows you to say, OK, give me n elements over request method. Do you see it? Yeah, this is really simple. The contract is as simple as pi. So we have publisher, we have subscriber. Subscriber say, subscribe me, please. And, subscribe, and publisher as a response sent as a subscription. So now the next interaction is going with subscription. You request some data, and of course, subscription sends some events back. This is really simple uh, contract and uh, design pattern, I would say. So, of course, we don't want to use just plain reactive streams because this is just a set of interfaces. We want to have some superset library like Project Reactor. So Project Reactor is, a, it's, is kind of wrapper and implementation of reactive streams. It allows you to, to build really functional and beautiful reactive code using lots of operator, which is built-in part in Reactor. And it allows you to handle multi-threading really simple. So let's take a look how we, what we can do with Project Reactor. Now I'm going to switch to my code back. I'm going to delete all this shitty stuff. And I'm going to, to create some basic implementation, the beginning of reactive, uh, reactive server. This is just a definition of how we can work with reactive Neo. This is basically my server definition. Some business logic, which is basically identical to what we saw before. OK, let me just align this guy. Oh, no like this, in order to make it a little bit more readable. OK, here we go. Just the same business logic. Nothing complex, but the complex is coming. Now we have to implement all the stuff we just saw before. We have to hide all the complexity of Neo inside reactor, reactive Neo, right? So we have to start with the start method because this is just the beginning of, beginning of everything. And here we have to create some convenient, convenient reactor code, which looks like that. It's a breezy. We just created a push method, which is basically will be, which will contain all the main or core engine of Neo. And we just saying here, we want to run everything inside this lambda, inside this handler of new subscribers on specific thread. So I can easily define on which thread I want to run everything. This is how it works. I'm running on new single thread, my, business, my main business logic, my main Neo server, and that's it. Then we have to create some core part, which looks like that. So that's how we can implement Neo, Neo first. Here's basically what we saw before the creation of non-blocking server socket channel, definition that it's basically non-blocking, opening selector, the, the, the definition of intent of accepting new connections, and of course, some, some convenient way, uh, if you want to dispose your flux or if you want to stop or cancel your flux or stream, this is a way to, to listen to this cancellation in, inside the push method, inside this lambda. Then. We have some while loop, which is basically doing looping until we cancel the stream. And here is a new connection acceptance, or a new selection, or a new events listening, listener, definition of listener. And that's basically it. 
Now we have to accept new socket channel. This is just the beginning of everything. But we don't want to write everything in one place, right? This, is, will be, this will be just a waste of everything, a waste of your time, and it will be absolutely unclear. That's why we want to delegate everything related to reads, writes, of, from socket channel to a separate, separate class. That's why we have here a connection interface. Do you remember this interface? This is basically an interface which gives you a receive method, or basically a stream or flux of byte buffers, so you can easily write or, and process your byte buffers as you wish. And of course, there is a method send, which accept publisher, which allows you to send whatever you want as a stream. So we, we want to implement that. I have a blueprint of connection, so it's basically default connection, which doesn't have any logic. In order to start, we have to define a few, a few important parts or a few important fields. So we want to have in our default connection, first of all, we want to have a socket channel, which, which we just accepted. So let me rename this guy. So we want to have a socket channel in our default connection. We want to have a selection key, because selection key, current selection key, brings you lots of kind of usable information, like selector, like ability to define your next action, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to have this guy here, and of course we want to have some way to propagate another events, like selection key about reads and selection key about writes. Since you want to define everything in reactive way, we want to have only project reactor and reactor streams. That's why we want to define all these guys like this. So let me hide some complex part of this. And what we want to have, we want to have, as I said, socket channel, read notification. So this is basically a stream of selection key which says, okay, our selection, our socket channel are ready to, to, give, to, to give you some data. And the same about writes. So this is basically a stream which gives you selection keys with information, hey, our selection uh, socket channel are ready to, 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 to be kind of, to, to, to write in. Is it clear so far what's going on here? Any questions? Okay, let's move forward. Now we want to use and we want to create, we want to return a stream of byte buffers, right? So in order to return a stream of byte buffers, we have to read from socket channel. This is, only, this is the only way to, to read from, to, to get some data, to read it from socket channel. But we have to start reading from socket channel only and only when we got a notification that we have some data, right? So we want to create something like read from here, then we want to map our socket channel to another representation. Of course, once we got this socket channel, we want to uh, take, not socket channel, but selection key, not current, but okay. Ah, sorry. Selection key, yes. Once we got this selection key, we want to start reading from this, from this channel, and so forth and so on. But along with that, do you remember, we have to say first that we want to read it all. So we have to do, before any other actions, we have to, to take our current selection key, get a selector, of course, and we have to say to our socket channel, hey, buddy, please register this selector, and please register it with some specific flag, like uh, selection key with selection key operation read. That's what we have to do before anything. But the next question, are we ready to read right now? Are we ready to read at this point? Do you think we are ready? I don't think so. We are ready only and only when we got a subscriber, when someone subscribed to our stream. That's why it's important to start reading only and only when our stream is subscribed. So we have to use another approach from Project Reactor like do something on subscribe. And this is a convenient way to listen to subscription. So we are going to, to cheat a little bit. I'm going to, to put here some code snipping. And I'm going to hide some parts, of course, complex part. But basically, what we want to do, we want to listen for subscription. And only when we got subscription, we say, OK, now we are ready to read. And only after that, we have to start processing data. But do you see the problem? Here I'm using handle. Do you know what, is, what handle does? So I guess you know what map does, right? 
This is the simplest, the simplest part of project of any streaming mechanism. The map, what this map you have to do, just read the bytes and then you return what you read. This is simple. But the problem here that you can read, read only zero bytes, right? You can, it may happen that you read nothing. There is no, no, there is no data in the stream. So this is a problem. And of course, one of the options to return an empty byte buffer, but this is incorrect because this byte buffer will be written back to, to output. There is no way to check whether it's empty or not. So another option is to return null, right? But the, pro the next problem is that null is prohibited in reactive streams. It's not accepted, it's not allowed to return null. And IDE won't advise you that null is prohibited. It will say, okay, just return null, no highlights, and that's it. So this is a problem in which handle will allow you to, 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 handle your, to handle some data, to do some mapping, whatever you need, and to filter some data. So how it can happen, let me, let me show you. What do you have, with, what, what do you got with this uh, with handle? So basically let me expand these parameters. With handle you get a selection key, which is upstream data, and something called synchronous sync which you have to use during this execution synchronously. And whether you have some data, you have to say, okay, sync next, which means I provided some data, some transformed data. Or in case this guy hasn't been called, you will just filter this data. This is amazing, the combination of map and filter. This is cool. So what else? What else do you have to do? Of course, you have to start listening to processed stream or output stream. And basically what you have to do, you have to subscribe, call in method subscribe, you have to provide a subscriber like this, like this. But this is really complex. And here ID suggest you that, wait, stop, don't do that. Don't use plain subscriber, don't try to create a plain subscriber, this is inconvenient way. Okay, this is inconvenient way. Project Reactor offers something called new base subscriber. And this is something you can use really easily and safely. So what basically you can do with that? You can override some hooks, whatever you want. So we have to, to override these two guys, and that's it. But here another problem. Why do we have to create another anonymous class here? It's just increase the complexity of everything, right? So let's just do the simplest. Let's just try to extend our base connection. Let's just create our connection as a base subscriber of byte buffers. And let's override those methods, like hook on next and hook on subscribe here. And the first action, in order to start any processing, you have to, of course, request the first piece of data, the first element. Is it clear? So far, so good. Do, do you get it? Everything that's going on here? Okay, I hope there is no question so far, because this is the simplest part. The next is the worst, the worst. Now we have to write data back. So in order to write data back, we have to use socket channel. We have to say, okay, write data back. We got some byte buffer. Let me rename it to buffer. We got some buffer. We have to write it back. But everything, of course, is is this check it exception, so we have to do something like that. We have to move it out. We have to say a result, and got this result here. Of course, we have then propagate or wrap this exception to some unchecked EO exception in order to propagate, to throw it, to throw it upstream. And then we have a few cases. Okay, everything is written, so we have to just request for a next byte buffer, right? That's easy. However, there is a few corner cases. The first one, what if the result of execution is minus one? This could happen. And this means that something went wrong, your connection is closed, so you have to cancel everything. That's what you have to do at the very beginning. You have to cancel your stream, right? Or what if our buffer still has, has remaining data? So this is non-blocking, that's what I told you before. What happens if we have still some bytes inside our buffer? And this is another challenge. Here we have to store our buffer 
somewhere, I prepared some field here, which is called current byte buffer. So we have to store this buffer here and listen to write, write events, right? We have to say, OK, now we are ready to, to listen to writes operation. So let me quickly replace this code with some snippet. And what we have to basically do, we have to use current selection key, which is stored in the field. We have to say, OK, now we are interested in operation writes. And we have, OK, wake up, buddy, give me something. That's what we have to do. Do you see it? This, this, is, this is a little bit complex part. All right, now we have to use another flux, another stream of write notifications, and we have to somehow start listening to them. So what we can do, we can, once we got a subscription, once everything is subscribed, we can say, okay, now let's listen to, to write notifications. So let's subscribe to the stream. And once we get something, let's try to, to do something. Let's try to continue writing the current buffer, right? This is basically what we have to do. Is it clear? Does it make sense? OK, silence. I hope it's easier you get everything or nothing. All right. Be polite here. Everything is good. So let's just create some read listening or write listening. So let's just listen to write. Of course, we have to update. This is another complexity of Neo. We have to store the latest selection key. This is another challenge. On every new selection key, we have to rewrite previous one, and that's it. That's how it works. That's some addition to that. And basically, we have to subscribe to, to our stream. We have to use a little bit of reactor code in order to make everything asynchronous from runnable. So let's do like this like that. And now we're almost ready. The final part is that we have to, to do something with our connection. So we have to start processing this connection. Don't worry, lots of code, that's fine. So what we basically do here? Basically, let me rename it back again to selection key. What we basically do here? So we create a connection. Here is our connection. We provide our connection with everything required for handling data and reading and writing to, to this connection. So this is selection channel, this is selection key, this is flux for reads selection key, this is flux for write selection key. And in order to feed our fluxes manually, we have to use processors because this is a convenient way to write to flux and read from it. Do you see it? So this is a convenient way for Project Reactor to, to feed your flux. So we associate, of course, these two fluxes with some selection uh, socket channel in order to, 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 to provide something like before. And now we have to feed our, um, our reads. We have to provide and feed our flux with new selection key about reads and do the same about writes. Right certification. So that's it. Now we can try to run our application. Let's run it. So it's running. And try to connect to it. And it works. Magic, right? A little bit of magic and it works. And the most important, if we are going to run our doser, everything will be amazing. Do you see it? In a less than a second, we got 10,000 of connections. That's amazing. That's really high speed, performant application. And at the same time, we still are able to, to provide some data. Just a second ago, we created Node.js server. Why Node.js? Let me go to, to my slides. Let me open my monitor application and let's see what's going on with CPU right now. Basically only one core is used because the, the, the rest of them are allocated for my doser. So my doser is still using lots of uh, cached thread. 
So let me show you this body. So everything is run on separate thread. That's why part of the cores are allocated for, for some doser functionality, but in general, only one core is pretty loaded. So let's go back to the slides. And let's do some quick summary of what happened just a few moments before. So in order to start reading from the channel, we have to wait for a subscription. That's why we have to wait for our subscriber and only start reading after that. In order to do map and filter and avoid empty byte buffers and nulls, we have to, hand to use handle. This is a convenient part of reactor. Then in order to feed your stream, we have to use processors. And one of the more advanced options from Project Reactor is sinks, or yeah, this is basically sync or flux sync. Finally, base subscriber is a convenient way to create a subscriber, save subscriber from any perspective, like from multi-threading perspective, from anything. This is a convenient way from Project Reactor to subscribe to, to, to your stream and start listening for updates. All right. But as I said, we want to have some multi-threading pro data processing. So let's do some multi-threading implementation. And this is the easiest part of our demo. Don't worry. In order to start doing some multi-threading stuff, we have to just use in one operator. Do you know which one? Right, publish on. We have to start using publish on in two places. So let me show you some few more things. There is something, call it like there is another uh, abstraction around thread pools in Reactor, which is called scheduler. And here we, we are using scheduler par parallel. But in order to allocate one connection per kind of per scheduler to, to, to attach some connection to particular scheduler, there is another way which is called scheduler single. So we take one worker from a pool of workers and say everything which, is, which will be going inside this connection will, should, be handled, should be handled on this particular scheduler. That's what we are doing here. We take one scheduler and then we say, OK, we want to run everything on this particular scheduler. So we want to publish everything on this scheduler. And then we say, OK, we want to run everything, all the writes. It's, this is important to write everything on the same scheduler again. And that's it. Now we have multi-threading. We process every byte, every byte buffer on the same thread. This is important stuff. All right, let's just try to stop our doser, stop everything, and run it again with multi-threading. OK, a well, few more things in order to ensure you that everything now is multi-threaded. OK, let me go back. Let me put some lock here. And yeah, that's basic in here. And let me run it. So now we will see that everything is scheduled on new separate thread, different from the main one. OK, let me connect to this again. And here we go. Everything is processed on scheduler parallel one. Now let me open another connection. And now everything on the second connection is scheduled by parallel two. Of course, if, I go, if I'm going to, to create more than 12 connections, the previous schedulers will be reused and shared between several connections. This is pretty cool. OK, let's go and run the, the doser again. Let's just rerun it and ensure that everything is still working. Something went wrong. Let's see. OK, let's have a look at this. OK, let me, let me stop it. Let me remove locks from here in order to avoid too many messages and rerun this guy again. OK, it's running. Run it again. OK, wait. What's wrong with that? Let's run it. Oh, it, come on, buddy. OK, it's running, running, slower for some reasons. 
maybe because my computer now processing everything on separate threads. So let, let's try to cool it a little bit. Okay, it's still running. Still running. Still running. Why it's still running? It should be fail. It should just throw an exception. This is something unexpected. I expected an exception here. This is funny. This is a problem. Come on. I, I want to show you an exception. Let me kill everything. So I have a magic. Kill all Java. Let's kill everything. And run it again. It should throw an exception. Throw an exception. Do that. Oh, that's better. No. OK, so everything works fine. <laughs> That's pretty good. I'm, I'm going to show you what could happen, what should happen, at least. Basically, what could happen is that you can easily overflow your, your publish on operator, because now everything happens asynchronously. And this guy don't know where, when it should stop, so it basically will send as many I'm ready to read or selection keys to this guy. And at one point in time, you will see overflow. Maybe it, hap it will happen. In order to solve this overflow, we have to use another approach. We have to prevent overwhelming of our publish on queue, so we have to use on pressure latest because we don't care about every selection key. We care only about notifications that we are ready. That we, that's, that's why it's acceptable to skip the rest of the keys and just read from, just, just get one notification. That's why we have to use, okay, the, the last try to, to kill this guy. I hope it will happen right now. That's magic. Yeah, so it, it just worked. The final point here is to use on back pressure latest and everything will be golden. All right, let's go to our presentation and let's do some sum up. So what you have to note here. First of all, if you want to use some parallelization, use scheduler's parallel. It will give you, it will give to your publish on operator one worker and it will allow you to process everything on this scope of workers in general. However, if you want to process everything on particular one scatterer, on particular one worker from the pool of workers, you have to wrap it into single one, which will take only one worker from the pool and will process everything on the same connection. This is important part. What next? First of all, let's do some sum up. Neo one is really complex, that's true. Reactive streams could simplify everything to the maximum and you will get and you will have natural continuation of TCP connection to reactive streams in Java, which is amazing. It brings back pressure to you. So you can reserve your stability of application and you can just process data whenever you are ready to process and whenever the output is ready to process. Finally, Project Reactor simplifies everything. It gives you lots of useful operators, etc., etc., and you can process everything really cool. Finally, multi-threading is built in in Reactor. Of course, everything that you have seen is hidden within the Netty project. And if you want to use Netty project in a reactive way, you have to use Project Reactor because it's already kind of wrapper in uh, using Project Reactor around Netty. However, along with Neo 1, there is Neo 2. But Neo 2 is absolutely different story. It's much better, so try it. But this is a different story. To learn more, if you want to learn more, a little bit more about Neo 1, just follow the video link. It's a good, uh, good kind of presentation from Hein Kabutz, which, uh, kind of, which inspired me to give this presentation, how to improve the Neo 1 using Project Reactor. More about Project Reactor, and of course, take a look at Project Reactor Netty. That's basically it. If you have any questions, 
just ask me. Thank you for your attention. And of course, don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Do we have any questions so far? Lots of hardcore, I understand. That's pretty fine. Don't worry. Just grab your coffee and enjoy the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Don't be shy. Run from it. Run from complexity. <laughs> <laughs>